All right, so in Gen uh, Judges chapter number 14, let's dig right in here. Let's reread here verse number 1. The Bible reads, And Samson went down to Timnath and saw a woman in Timnath of the daughters of the Philistines. And he came up and told his father and his mother and said, I have seen a woman in Timnath of the daughters of the Philistines. Now, therefore, get her for me to wife. Then his father and his mother said unto him, Is there never a woman among the daughters of thy brethren or among all, thy pe all my people that thou goest to take a wife of the uncircumcised Philistines? And Samson sa said unto his father, Get her for me, for she pleaseth me well. But his father and his mother knew not that it was of the Lord that he sought an occasion against the Philistines. For at that time, the Philistines had dominion over Israel. Now, of course, chapter 14, we're really starting to get into the stories of Samson. Last week, we went over basically the story of his parents and how Samson came to being, how it was a miraculous birth, basically, and he was going to be a Nazarite from the womb. And um, at the very end of the, the passage from last week, it starts to tell us about, you know, Samson is born, and then at the last verse, it says in verse 25, And the Spirit of the Lord began to move him at times in the camp of Dan between Zorah and Eshdael. So Samson is a man that God is lifting up to become this leader, to become uh, this, this deliverer for the children of Israel, because the children of Israel have fallen under the oppression of the Philistines. And God has decided to raise up a deliverer, and that is coming through Samson. Samson is the one that God has chosen here. And um, that's why it says there in verse number four, his father and mother knew not that it was of the Lord that he sought an occasion against the Philistines. For at that time, the Philistines had dominion over Israel. Now, I used to think differently. I used to understand this passage a little bit different. And I'm going to explain what I believe now about this passage. When you read this passage where it says, um, you know, basically what's happening is Samson wants to marry a daughter of the Philistines. And we know in the scripture that, that God's word tells us that we're not supposed to be, you know, that they weren't supposed, the children of Israel were not supposed to be marrying of the heathen. And today, we're not supposed to be marrying people who are unsaved. The Bible's clear about that. We're supposed to be, you know, the, the reference back then, it's, it's God's people should be marrying other God's people. Now, if someone from another nationality came and joined themselves unto Israel, that was perfectly fine within the law, and they would join themselves to one of the tribes of Israel, and then that marriage would be fine. They weren't supposed to go out, though, and find some wife of the heathen land because the Bible says that their heart would, would be brought away from the Lord. That the, that the wife that they found that was of, the heathen la of, of, of these heathen lands, that their wife would, would draw them away from serving the Lord. That's why God didn't want them. It's not because God preferred the Hebrew race over other races. It has nothing to do with race whatsoever. It has to do with worshiping and serving God. And people will take this stuff out of context and try to tell you there shouldn't be interracial marriages and all this other stuff and God wants these. You know, that couldn't be farther from the truth. God made all nations of one blood and the and the bible says that uh you know just the fact that other people from other nations were able to join and become part of israel and become part of the tribes and you're supposed to treat them just like anyone else any stranger any foreigner that comes and joins themselves part of israel you're just like anybody else just like one born in the land and all the laws apply the same way and that's what the bible teaches it's the same way today anyone who's born again in jesus christ you become a brother and sister in christ doesn't matter what your background is. Doesn't matter who your parents are. Doesn't matter what your genealogy is. It's the same concept. Now, but but what he does here is he sees this woman that's living in the uh, Philistia, you know, in, in Timnath, which is that which belonged under the Philistines, and he sees this woman and he wants to marry this woman. Now, and his parents are trying to say, hey, you know, can you find someone else like someone among your brethren, like? like some child, some daughter of Israel to marry instead of going unto the Philistines and marrying one of them, their women. And he's like, nope, I want a Philistine. You know, like, I, I want this woman, if I, you know, get her to me for wife. Come on, dad, go, go get this woman for me. I want to have this woman to be my wife. And that's, and that's what's happening here. But in verse number four, it says, his mother and his father knew not that it was of the Lord that he sought an occasion against the Philistines. For at that time, the Philistines had dominion over Israel. When I used to read this verse, I used to think that it was of the Lord that Samson wanted to marry this woman. But I don't believe that to be true. 
when it says here it was of the Lord that he sought an occasion against the Philistines, I used to read that as it was of the Lord that the, that the Lord wanted to seek an occasion against the Philistines. So that's why he's marrying this woman. But actually what it is is that Samson wanted to seek an occasion against the Philistines because he was going to be the deliverer. And we're going to see this uh, in just a minute. We're going to turn and look at Moses because Moses is a great example of someone who knew he was going to be a deliverer. He knew he was going to try to help his, the children of Israel, but he went about it the wrong way. Samson is another example of that. Samson wanted to seek an occasion against the Philistines, which is why he wanted to marry this Philistine woman. He's actually trying to stir up some trouble, but he doesn't really know how. He wants to make this fight. He wants to bring things to a head, and he wants to be free from being under the bondage of the Philistines, but he's going about doing it the wrong way. So he chooses to, to, to set his sights on this woman. He says, hey, you know, no, no, I want to marry this woman. And it's because, see, his mother and his father didn't know that he sought an occasion against the Philistines. Now, that was of the Lord that Samson was seeking an occasion against the Philistines. That was of God. God was going to use him to be the deliverer, to be the judge. That was of God. But the way that he went about doing it, I don't think was of God. Because why would God instill in someone a desire to do something contrary to what the Bible teaches? Amen. And that's just not the case. And I also don't, I, I think the reason why, you know, the way I used to understand this passage can be a little bit dangerous because you start to make you think, well, God made me, you know, fall in love with this person. And then when something goes bad in your marriage and you're, you know, like, like you start thinking weird things, you start thinking, oh God, God made this. No, look, God given you the freedom to pick and choose who it is, whoever it is that you want to marry. Now he's given us guidelines. He's told us what we should be doing. And, you know, like I said earlier, not if someone is, uh, if someone's unsaved and you're saved, you shouldn't be marrying that person. That's being unequally yoked together. But other than that, I mean, you want to, you want to find someone that you like and God gives you the freedom to do that just as much as he gives you liberty to do many other things. So, um, and it's just kind of the way it wor it's worded here and what the antecedent is and what you're looking at is who is he sought an occasion. It's, you know, um, you could probably see how I understood that the wrong way, but I just want to make sure that that's clear because if I thought the wrong way, there's probably other people who might have read that the same way that I did. But I think it's, it's that is false. The, the right way to understand this and, and what this verse is actually saying is that Samson was seeking an occasion against the Philistines. And that seeking an occasion against the Philistines is of God. That God wanted him to seek an occasion against the Philistines so that he could deliver the children of Israel. It just was, it sh he wasn't supposed to be doing it through this mechanism by, tr by marrying some heathen woman. He, he could have done many other things to do that. And we're, as we get into this too, we'll see um, how he does that. Like with his bet is when he basically is seeking that occasion against the Philistines. He's trying to stir up some problems, but we'll get to that in a little bit. Um, look at verse number five. Then went Samson down and his father and his mother to Timnath and came to the vineyards of Timnath and behold, a young lion roared against him and the spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him and he rent him as he would have rent a kid and he had nothing in his hand, but he told not his father or his mother what he had done. So as they're going down to his mother, his father and Samson are going, are traveling down to Timnath because he's going to get his way. He's the only child, right? So, of course, his parents are going to get him what he wants. Just like all oh, <laughs> Just kidding. But they're going down to Timnath. And as they're in the way, you know, he must be separated from his parents. And there's this lion that roars in the way. And he ends up killing that lion with his bare hands. So he just, and, and it says here that he, uh, he rented as he would have rent a kid, like a, a little goat. Right, like a baby goat, the same way he'd be able to manhandle a baby goat, he just manhandles this lion and destroys this lion with his bare hands. But he doesn't tell anybody about it. So like he has this, this crazy story happen. And, and, and one thing you'll notice about Samson, he's able to keep his mouth shut for a while. Because that's pretty juicy. But, but one of his downfalls is that he doesn't keep his mouth shut <laughs> when he really ought to. He, he gets worn down to the point where he just just tells his secrets, you know, and, and that ends up becoming a, a, a snare for him. But what I want to teach on, because one thing that you'll find about Samson 
is that the Bible says that the Spirit of the Lord comes upon him and he's filled with the Spirit of the Lord. And it's saying more than anyone else in the entire Bible, you're going to read that about Samson in Scripture, that the Spirit of God came upon him. And I want to just spend a little bit of time tonight just explaining the difference between the Spirit of God coming upon somebody versus the Spirit of God indwelling you and being inside of you. So if you probably heard about, you know, when you're born again, Christian, when you're born again, that the Holy Spirit comes and resides inside of you and, and comes and, and lives. You have the Holy Spirit of God in you as a believer in Christ. And this is something that's very commonly taught among many Christian, you know, d denominations and belief systems that, that this is, you know, because it, it's true, it's evident. We'll, we'll, I'll show you the scriptures in a minute. So that's something that people kind of take for granted as a doctrine because it's so widely known and so widely taught. And because we've been in the New Testament for so long, I think it leads people to then become confused about certain Old Testament passages because you're so used to thinking about the Holy Spirit indwelling people. And what people will tend to do is maybe start to think and keep your place here in Judges 14, but turn to Psalm 51. I want to show you an example of this where some people will start to teach, oh no, you can lose your salvation. No, it's possible for you to, you know, after you're saved, do something to where God will take away His Holy Spirit from you and then you won't be saved anymore. People will teach that or think that based on a lot of Old Testament and some New Testament scriptures that will refer to God removing His Spirit from people. And this is why it's so important to understand that there's a distinction between God's spirit being on a person or coming upon somebody where God is literally enduing them with power through his spirit, but it's not his Holy Spirit that's residing within him. That is something separate that was given in the New Testament only that Old Testament believers did not have and something that was given as an extra bonus for us. And we'll see where Jesus Christ talks about that in the book of John. But look at Psalm 51, verse number nine. The Bible reads, Hide thy face from my sins and blot out all mine iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. So this is a Psalm of David. This is David, you know, uh, writing these words. Obviously, it's the word of God, but it's still coming and being penned down by David. And he's, he's writing here saying, hey, you know, cast me not away from thy presence and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. The unlearned and ignorant will look at this and say, well, maybe, you know, David's worried about losing his salvation. But that's not the case, especially if you keep reading. And this is why it's important, too, if someone's trying to teach you, oh, no, you can lose your salvation. They want to point to a verse like this. Always keep reading and always get the, the context of what's being said. Just I mean, that's a that's a rule for any time you have Bible discussion or you're trying to, to figure out what the Bible means, because verse number 12, it says, restore unto me the joy of thy salvation and uphold me with thy free spirit. It doesn't say restore unto me thy salvation. So restoring to me the joy of thy salvation. Because here's what happens. In Psalm 51, David is very grieved. David sinned against God. David sinned against God very grievously. And now he's being repentant. Now David is seeking to get back in good standing with the Lord. He's sorry. His heart broken. And he wants to get right with God. Imagine you being a born again believer, being a child of God. You're born into God's family. You're God's son. You're God's daughter. And you are living your life and you're doing good. And then all of a sudden you do something really bad. And you feel really bad about it. You feel terrible about it. Well, what are you going to do? You're probably going to feel like David did here and saying, you know, God, help me. Hide your face from my sins. Blot out my iniquity. You know, Please just forgive me for what I've done. Give me a clean heart. Renew a right spirit within me. I want to do what's right. Help me, cleanse me, and cast me not away from thy presence. I don't want to just be cast aside, Lord, and not used of you and, and not be in your good standings or in your good graces. 
uh, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Why? Because when God's Holy Spirit came upon people, they had a lot of power and boldness and did great works for God. And David wanted to do great things for God, so he's saying, don't take your Holy Spirit from me. He's not worried about his own personal salvation, his soul going to hell. That's not what's being spoken here at all. And that's why he says, restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. Hey, when you're living right and doing good and you're just being, you know, as a saved child of God, you have a lot of joy. You ought to have a lot of joy. I have a lot of joy. I know when, when things are going good, it's a great life. Even when you're going through troubles and trials and persecutions, when you are doing right and you know that you're, you're doing what God wants you to do, I mean, obviously not perfectly, but you know, you're, you're, you're doing pretty good. There's a lot of joy there. But when you screw up and you sin, man, the, the grief, the sorrow, just like when, when the apostle Peter denied the Lord, when he denied him three times, you know, and then Jesus looked on him. The Bible says that Peter went out and he wept bitterly. And he was really devastated. That was, a, that was a really big blow to Peter. He felt really bad about that. You know, we find really like, man, what did I do? It broke him. He had a broken heart. You know, he was sorry. He was sad and that he had sinned against God and, and had done that. And, um, you know, we all probably have come to a point like this, maybe at some point in our life, but that's what he's saying here. He's saying, take not the Holy Spirit from me. He's not referring to his own personal salvation. Because if that's what he was talking about, then you've got so many other contradictions in the Bible and talks about eternal life and Jesus Christ dying for all of our sins and everything like that. I'm not going to get into all the eternal security proofs tonight, but um, I want to show you this difference. Turn now to John chapter 14. And I, I, I didn't bother going through all these Old Testament references of the Spirit of the Lord coming upon people because we're going to be getting into that a lot more as we just read through all these chapters. So just pay attention to that as you read the Old Testament because it's not just in the book of Judges. It's all throughout the Bible where God's Spirit, God's, the Holy Ghost comes upon people and they're able to do great works. And you see the same thing, by the way, in the New Testament as well. Just because someone has the Holy Spirit of God indwelling them, living inside of them, does not mean that the power of God or the power of the Holy Ghost is resting on them to do great works. Because you receive that Holy Spirit indwelling you just for, by virtue of being saved. Whereas God putting His power on you is, is more based on your works and on what you're doing. Obviously, you have to already be saved, but, you know, God giving that power and resting it on you is going to be dependent on, on you and, and what you're doing. So they're two different things. John chapter 14, look at verse number 16. This is Jesus Christ mentioning the indwelling of the Holy Spirit to come, where he's, he's prophesying of this. Verse number 16, it says, And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever. Even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. But ye know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. Now, Jesus says right here, he says, you know the Holy Spirit. He dwells with you. The Holy Spirit has been around them, has been with them, has been enduing them with power when they're going out and casting out devils, when they're healing people, when they're ministering to people, the Holy Spirit has been right there with them, giving them power. But then he says, he shall be in you. That's the future tense. That's something that's going to happen. That's something that hadn't happened yet. And, he, and he's telling, he's explaining to them, yeah, and, and you know, ultimately, he's explaining his own death, his own, you know, his, his own sacrifice, and that he's going to die, and he's going to depart from them, and he's going to leave, but don't worry. See, while he's on the earth, and he's with his disciples, and he's with the believers, they've got nothing to worry about. They're comforted. Why? Because Jesus is there. What about when they're, when they're out in the boat, and everyone's worried who they go to? They go to Jesus, and they can get comfort from Jesus. When he's physically there with them, he's their comforter. But he's, he's telling them now, hey, I'm going to go away. I've got some other work to do. I've got to be crucified. I've got to, I've got to be resurrected. I have to go into heaven. I have to 
sprinkle the blood on mercy. You know, I've got stuff to do. But don't worry, because you won't be comfortless. God's going to give you a comforter. And he's referring to the Holy Spirit. He says the Spirit of truth is going to dwell in you. So he, he explains that to them in John 14. And then in John chapter 20, we're going to see when the people actually receive that Holy Spirit inside of them as an indwelling of the Holy Spirit of God. In John chapter 20, verse number 22, this is after the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The Bible says, And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Whosoever sins ye remit, they are remitted unto them, and whosoever sins ye retain, they are retained. So he, he literally breathes on them, and they receive the Holy Ghost. And I believe this is when they receive the indwelling of the Holy Ghost. But just to prove my point a little bit further, he also instructed the disciples that they were to wait for him, and they were to wait until they would receive the power of the Holy Ghost and the Holy Ghost would come upon them and they, they weren't to go and travel and go anywhere else. They had to wait. And in Acts chapter 2 is when we see, Acts chapter 1 and chapter 2 is when we see that they're all gathered together in a room and then the, um, the Holy Ghost comes and they've got the, the, the tongues like a flame of fire that are, that are resting on each of them. And that's when they receive this great power from the Holy Ghost to speak with other tongues, to speak in other languages that, that the people around them that were there for, um, for the Passover were able to, um, you know, at the day of Pentecost, the people that were traveling from all over were be able to understand the gospel. They'd be able to understand the word of God in their native language. And that's when the Holy Spirit came upon them. They'd already been indwelled with the Holy Ghost when Jesus breathed on them, but they had to wait for the power to come. And you'll see the differentiation there very clearly. So I just wanted to kind of go through that real uh, briefly tonight and, and try to clear that up a little bit. Obviously, I could preach an entire sermon just on that one subject. There's so much material on that. But as we get into this, I just want to make sure there's no confusion when it talks about the Holy Spirit coming upon people. Well, why did it depart? Like, if the Holy Spirit of God departed from King Saul, does that mean he lost his salvation because then he went to a witch and he did all this other stuff? No. No, his salvation could never be lost, just like ours can't, because Jesus Christ paid for his sins, just like Jesus Christ paid for our sins. So if Jesus Christ is capable of paying for all of our sins today, he was also capable of paying all, all their sins before. And if we can't lose our salvation today, they couldn't lose their salvation back then either. Romans 4 explains very clearly that it's always been by grace through faith. Even going back to Abraham and Moses and you know, what saith David? Read Romans 4. It's a very good passage explaining all of that, just, just how clear it is that Old Testament, New Testament, salvation has always been by grace through faith. Let's go back to Judges chapter 14. So he had just killed that lion. The, whole, the, the, the Spirit of God came upon him and he got this extra might and this extra power to be able to just destroy that lion with his bare hands. Verse number 7 in Judges 14, the Bible reads, And he went down and talked with the woman, and she pleased Samson well. And after a time, he returned to take her, and he turned aside to see the carcass of the lion. And behold, there was a swarm of bees and honey in the carcass of the lion. So he goes down, he talks with the woman. He's like, hey, she's great. You know, I want to, I want to marry this person. And he goes back to then get married to this, to this woman. And as he's going back, he's like, hey, I want to check out that lion that I killed, right? Go back off the beaten trail off the side of the road where he, where he dumped the body of the lion. And he goes to check it out, and he sees there's this swarm of bees in the carcass. So they must have been torn open or whatever. And, uh, and they made a nest, the beehive, inside the, the dead body of the lion. And that's kind of gross, it really, I mean, you can see something like that happening, you know, this, this dead carcass and there's, you know, probably ants and animals and stuff and it's, and it's rotting. And then you've got these bees that have made their nest in there. So he sees it and he's like, oh, that's cool. And he goes and he takes some honey out of the beehive. And he just continues along his way and he's eating the honey. 
And then he goes and he gives some to his parents. It says here in verse number nine, and he took thereof in his hands and went on eating and came to his father and mother and he gave them and they did eat. Oh, hey, look, I got you some honey. Oh, thanks, Samson. That's so nice of you. And then it says, but he told not them that he had taken the honey out of the carcass of a lion. Yeah, I wonder why. They probably wouldn't have eaten it. I know I wouldn't have. We're like, yeah, that's great. But oh, no, yeah, not, not from a, the carcass of a dead lion. Why? Why wouldn't you eat that? Because it's unclean. It's unclean. Now, I'll read this for you in Leviticus chapter 11. I mean, there's, there is zero doubt that this, I mean, other than common sense, just telling you, yeah, that's pretty gross. I don't want to eat out of a dead animal. The carcass of a lion. The, the Bible literally says in Leviticus 11, 27, and whatsoever goeth upon his paws. So lions have paws? Yep. Among all manner of beasts that go on all four. Lions walk around on their paws on all four. Those are unclean unto you. Whoso toucheth their carcass shall be unclean until the even. Remember that, Na uh, that um, Samson had the Nazarite vow. He's supposed to have this Nazarite vow in him from the womb. And according to Nazarite vow, we went over a couple weeks ago, he's not supposed to touch any dead body. And he's supposed to keep himself clean. And that was this big deal between unclean and clean. And he's supposed to keep himself clean. So we see here one instance right away of Samson giving into the lust of his flesh to get that honey and becoming unclean as a result. And we're going to see Samson does this quite a bit. Unfortunately, this is one, this is one of the character flaws of Samson. For as much good as he's done, and for as much as God used him, for how many times the Spirit of God came upon him, he also had many qualities that, um, that were not so good. Now, I think Samson brings his own problems upon himself. You know, he, he could have been a much better deliverer, and, and I think someone used even more by God if, had he made some better choices in his life. But let's read here again in, in Judges chapter 14. Let's look down to verse number 10. The Bible reads, So his father went down unto the woman, and Samson made there a feast, for so used the young men to do. So basically he's, his dad goes down to, to, I think, facilitate the marriage. Right, probably gave a dowry or something unto the father and is, is kind of making things happen here with the woman while Samson makes this feast. So he's making this wedding feast. He's making this, this great feast and inviting people to, do, to, to come out for his marriage. And it says in verse 11, And it came to pass when they saw him that they brought 30 companions to be with him. And so here's Sam, Samson's a stranger in the, in the land of the Philistines. So he's throwing this great party, and they're like, oh, okay, well, here, we'll bring, we'll bring some guests. We'll furnish it with some guests, because Samson apparently didn't bring any friends down with him. So they're like, well, we need to have some people at this feast, so here's, here's 30 men, here's 30 companions to be with Samson. Verse number 12, And Samson said unto them, I will now put forth a riddle unto you. If ye can certainly declare it me within the seven days of the feast and find it out, then I will give you 30 sheets and 30 changes change of garments. But if ye cannot declare it me, then shall ye give me thirty sheets and thirty change of garments. And they said unto him, Put forth thy riddle that we may hear it. Now, this is where I said before, I believe this is where Samson is seeking an occasion against the Philistines. So he, 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 he's going down to marry this woman. But while he's there, now he's, he's bringing forth this bet. And you know, before I even get any further, you might understand, like, well, what's the big deal about, you know, 30 sheets and 30 change of garments? That doesn't sound like a big deal. I mean, just go to Walmart, right? I mean, what are you going to do? Spend, spend 25 bucks and, and you're good, right? And you've got it all covered. Well, it's not the way things have always been. There wasn't always a Walmart and all this manufacturing and all the, you know, all this stuff. Back in these days, a long time ago, you know, clothing was a very precious commodity, and oftentimes, and you'll, you'll, just by reading the Bible, you can understand this. You don't have to read any extra biblical sources. You don't have to read any history books. You don't have to read anything else. Just from the context of Scripture alone, you could learn this. You can learn when someone makes a, gives a pledge or when someone is, you know, needs to borrow something. The Bible talks about 
not keeping, like if they have to give you a garment just as, as collateral, so like they need to borrow something and they're like, okay, well, what are you gonna give me? Give you the shirt off my back, right? Because I don't have anything. If someone's that poor and they need to borrow something and you take something for collateral, the Bible says, you know what though? If that's all he has, you cannot just, you know, hold that overnight. Like you, you've got, he's got to be able to keep warm. Clothing was not manufactured in the past like it is now. It was all handmade. And the resources weren't as readily available, again, with all the machinery and all the technology that we have today to be able to mass produce stuff. It was handmade and it was made to last. They were, they were good. That's why the soldiers, you know, cast lots for Jesus' garment, for his vesture. Why? Because they didn't want it. They, they were trying to divide up everything that he had, but they didn't want to tear and ruin the clothing that he had. So they basically cast lots for it so that one of them was able to, to get that from him. You can go all throughout Scripture and find lots of different references to the clothing. And that, and that was one of the things that, uh, that Achan sinned about when in the book of Joshua. He, he saw this Babylonish garment. It was this, this fancy outfit along with silver and gold. But that was one of the things that was mentioned that, that caught his eye that he wanted to have. And you'll see many times where, where, you know, there's a big, there's a higher value than we place today on a change of garment. And you'll see people being, being rewarded with changes of garment or whatever. Like one change of garment is, is kind of a big deal where you can have an extra outfit, an extra suit, an extra whatever, you know, a piece or some, whatever the articles of clothing were, they would have an extra one of those. So this bet that he places it's basically either each person, because there's 30 people, either each one of them had to fork over one sheet and one change of garment, or he would give each one of them one, right? So they're, you know, it's one to one for them. But for Samson, man, if he loses, he's got to come up with 30 of these, <laughs> which is a lot. That's a, that's a, that's a, a big, a big bet, a big wager for Samson. And, um, but what he's trying to do here is because that is precious, though, that even just that one change of garment in the sheet, he's trying to make these people mad because he's like, I got this riddle. Nobody's going to know the answer to this. He's like, this is such a crazy story. You know, he kills this lion and then there's this, this beehive in there and he eats this honey out of it. And that's what he uses to create this riddle. And he never told anyone about it. He never told his parents that he killed the lion. He never told his parents that where the honey came from that he gave unto them. He's like, nobody's going to figure this out. This is just too nuts. So he tries to use this knowledge against them by making this bet, making this wager. And I believe he's hoping that they're just going to get angry with him and try to start a fight with him because he's seeking an occasion against the Philistines, which is why he went down to Mary. He needed a reason to be down there and start trouble. That's why he went to marry this woman. Um, turn back to Exodus chapter 2. We're going to see this in the life of Moses. Because Moses, like I mentioned earlier, he, he was someone who was supposed to deliver the children of Israel, but he went about it at first the wrong way. Now Moses turned out to be a great man of God. Even though he made this initial mistake, in trying to become the deliverer and try, in trying to, uh, to serve the Lord and, and do what, what, um, what he was meant to do, what God had, had intended on him to do, which was deliver the children of Israel. Exodus chapter 2, look at verse number 11. The Bible says, And it came to pass in those days when Moses was grown that he went out unto his brethren and looked on their burdens, and he spied an Egyptian smiting in Hebrew one of his brethren. And he looked this way and that way, and when he saw that there was no man, he slew the Egyptian and hit him in the sand. So Moses is brought up in Pharaoh's household. Moses is brought up with all these, you know, all, all the um, luxuries in Egypt of being in Pharaoh's household. But when he gets older, he's like, you know what, I want to I, I see my people. I want to go and reconnect with the Hebrews, and I want to serve the Lord. And he's willing to reject all that Egypt had to offer in order to, to become one with his people and to serve God and to, and, and to live his life that way. So as he's going out, 
to, to be among his people, he sees an Egyptian that's beaten up or hitting a, a Hebrew. And when he saw, he, he looked around and he's like, no one's looking. And he went and killed the Egyptian that was doing harm unto the Hebrew person and he buried him in the sand. That's one way of, of doing things, but that's not the right way of doing things. That's not what God had intended on him to do. It says in verse 13, And when he went out the second day, behold, two men of the Hebrews strove together. And he said to him that did the wrong, Wherefore smitest thou thy fellow? And he said, Who made thee a prince and a judge over us? Intendest thou to kill me as thou killest the Egyptian? And Moses feared and said, Surely this thing is known. So then when he goes and tries to break up a fight between the Hebrews, the guy's like, what, are you going to kill me like the other guy? And that got him scared because he's like, oh, well, someone must have seen him and word got out. And then he ends up hiding for 40 years. He ends up just leaving, going away, and not delivering the children of Israel for another 40 years. In Acts chapter 7, you don't have to turn if you want to. We're going to go back to Judges 14, but I'm just going to read this for you. When Stephen is given his great speech or his great sermon before he's martyred, before they kill him and stone him to death, He's preaching to these Pharisees and scribes and he goes through kind of this history and he covers what Moses did here. And in verse 17 of Acts 7, excuse me, verse 23 of Acts chapter 7, the Bible reads, And when he was full 40 years old, it came into his heart to visit his brethren, the children of Israel. And seeing one of them suffer wrong, he defended him and avenged him that was oppressed and smote the Egyptian. And then it says this, For he supposed his brethren would have understood how that God by his hand would deliver them, but they understood not. Moses thought that by him killing that guy, that the Hebrews would see, oh, here's someone who's coming to help us and to defend us and to, to defeat our enemies for us and to lead the way. But they didn't understand that based on his actions. I believe Samson has this same type of mindset. He knows that God wants to use him. He knows that he's, he's supposed to, to, to help to free the children of Israel and to overthrow the Philistines from, from being their oppressors. But he goes about it the wrong way. Let's go back to Judges chapter 14. Judges 14, so now he gives them the riddle. Judges 14, 14, the Bible says, And he said unto them, Out of the eater came forth meat, and out of the strong came forth sweetness. And they could not in three days expound the riddle. And it came to pass on the seventh day that they said unto Samson's wife, Entice thy husband that he may declare unto us the riddle, lest we burn thee in thy father's house with fire. Have ye called us to take that we have? Is it not so? So, a few things I want to cover here real, real briefly. Notice, first of all, that these people are like these sore losers, how they start blaming other people. Like, they got involved with this bet. Samson's wife had nothing to do with this at all. And they take this challenge. They take on the riddle, thinking that, hey, there's 30 of us. We, one of us can figure this out. And they're like, well, what did you even call us here? Because remember, they were called down to, like, to join this feast because Samson didn't have any friends, so these, these 30 guys came. And um, <laughs> he says, have you, know, have you called us to take what we have? Is that why you even brought us here? So you're going to steal our stuff from us? No, you're the one that, that got involved with the stupid bet. You, should, you shouldn't have gotten involved with the riddle if you weren't uh, willing to lose whatever it was that you had. But you can see here, I mean, they're willing to kill for it. This also shows that the love of money is the root of all evil. Right. I mean, they're threatening to kill this woman and burn her father's house down yeah. over a bet, mm -hmm. over a change of garments and a sheet for each of them. And yeah, like I said before, they're precious. It might cost a lot of money, but like, you made your bed. I mean, now sleep in it. You're the one that, that decided to gamble. If you decide to gamble and lose, you know, you've got no one to blame but yourself. 
But see, this is one of the reasons why gambling is wrong and that no Christian should ever get involved in gambling anyways because the love of money is the root of all evil. You may have integrity and say, okay, well, if I lose it, I lose it, but what about someone else? You put yourself in a situation around people who love money and that's why they're going around gambling and trying to get more money and that's all they care about is getting more money. Bad things happen. And even if they weren't actually going to do it, I mean, they were willing to threaten to kill. And who knows what they would have done? Who knows? Look at verse number 16. The Bible says, And Samson's wife wept before him and said, Thou dost but hate me and lovest me not. Thou hast put forth a riddle unto the children of my people and hast not told it me. And he said unto her, Behold, I have not told it my father nor my mother, and shall I tell it thee? And she wept before him the seven days while their feast lasted. So, just so you realize this, obviously this is giving us more information here. It was on the seventh day that they threatened to kill him. I believe they probably went to his wife right away. Hey, get him to tell us what it is. Because it says here that she wept before him all seven days. She's crying, oh, you don't love me. You married me, but you, know, you won't even tell me. I mean, aren't we supposed to trust each other? Can't you just tell me what this is? And he wouldn't tell her until the seventh day. It says, and she wept before him the seven days while their feast lasted. And it came to pass on the seventh day that he told her because she lay sore upon him. Well, I wonder why she lay sore upon him. Probably because they said they were going to kill her in her father's household. But she's really laying into him and crying and, and getting him to tell her. It says, and, and then she told the riddle to the children of her people. So then she goes and tells them, probably just because she's scared and they're, you know, they're threatening to kill her. So she goes and tells them and then they answer the riddle, verse number 18, and the men of the city said unto him on the seventh day before the sun went down, what is sweeter than honey and what is stronger than a lion? And he said unto them, if ye had not plowed with my heifer, ye had not found out my riddle. So th this use of words shows, I think, that Samson was a little upset Obviously, he's talking about, you know, what's a heifer? It's a, you know, it's a, it's a, a bull or, or a cow, you know, out that's, that's doing work in a field. And he's saying, well, you're plowing, you're, you're working along with, with my heifer. Well, he's calling his wife the heifer because that's who they had been working with. So um, he's pretty, pretty upset about that. But he's saying, yeah, you, you wouldn't have found it out if you didn't get it from her. Verse 19 says, And the Spirit of the Lord came upon him, and he went down to Ashkelon and slew 30 men of them, and took their spoil and gave change of garments unto them which expounded the riddle. And his anger was kindled, and he went up to his father's house. So he ends up paying up. But he didn't, he didn't have the money to do it. See, I mean, he thought he had this thing locked in. He thought he had this bet won until it turned back around on him. So what he did, he goes down to another Philistine town. He goes down to Ashkelon. And he just, he kills 30 people there. But what's interesting about this is the Bible says the Spirit of the Lord came upon him. God gave him the power to go down and do this. God wanted him to, to be able to, to do these fight, you know, to fight against the Philistines and overthrow them and stuff. Um, obviously, he's getting himself kind of in a situation that he, that he could have gone about this a different way, but, um, but the Spirit of the Lord comes upon him, he goes down and he kills these 30 men, gives them the spoil, and then, he, and then he's so angry he just leaves. He goes back to his father's house. Now, I don't think he consummated his marriage yet, probably not, because usually they would have these feasts, like they would have the, the, the wedding ceremony and they'd have this feast, and this feast was supposed to last seven days. And they're having this big party for the, for the marriage. Obviously, he had married her because it's, it calls the woman Samson's wife in verse 16. Samson's wife wept before him. So they had gotten married. Um, whether or not they consummated the marriage, he just ends up leaving. Now, he doesn't divorce her. He just leaves. He's just upset. Like, I can't believe you did this. I can't believe you told them. I had to go down and do this stuff. You know, and he's real bitter and mad that he, he lost his bet and everything else. And it didn't work out the way he wanted it to. But then what happens here in verse number 20, it says, but Samson's wife was given to his companion whom he had used as his friend. So basically his wife is given to another man and becomes his wife. 
and we'll see the, the ramifications that to come. But the last lesson to learn from this, from this chapter tonight, is you shouldn't just be using people to be your friends. Because that's what he did here. It says he had used him as his friend, his companion. He just used him, which means he wasn't his real friend. He just had something. It was convenient for him to be friends with them. It's, well, what can I get out of this friendship? And that's what it means to be using somebody. And those are never the types of friends you should have. Whether someone's using you or you're using someone else, God forbid you would just use somebody to be your friend. That's not right. And if you're going to use someone to be your friend, you can't be surprised when something like this happens. Why? Because if it was his real friend, his real friend would be like, no, you're married to my friend. No, I'm not going to marry you. That's my friend. There's no way I'm going to do that. I respect my friend. I love my friend. I can never do that to my friend. And that's how a good friend would be. Someone who cares you, someone who loves you. you know. But if you're just being used, where's the love? Who cares? And that's what you get from, for using people. Uh, Proverbs 14, verse number 20. You can turn to Proverbs. There's, there's a, a few passages I just want to show you real quick. You need to watch out for people that want to be your friend just because they want to use you. And those of you that have trucks know what I'm talking about. <laughs> There's always someone that wants someone to use a truck. Oh, you got a truck? You can help me move this. You know? <laughs> a, a, a man with a truck is, is, is easy to find friends, right? Dude? <laughs> Just like someone, who, you know, someone who's got a lot of money. The Bible talks about someone who gives gifts also has a lot of friends. In, uh, in Proverbs chapter 14, verse number 20. Proverbs 14, verse number 20, the Bible reads, The poor is hated even of his own neighbor, but the rich hath many friends. Yeah, of course the rich man has a lot of friends, but they're not real friends. The rich has a lot of friends because there's a lot of people that want to get something from the rich guy. Oh, you're rich. Oh, maybe you'll buy my lunch for me. Oh, maybe you'll give me something. Oh, maybe you'll invite me here, invite me to a meal. Invite me, you know, That's using someone to be a friend. And that's not something we ought to do. Not as a believer, not as a Christian, not as a child of God. You shouldn't be looking to use people because of their position, because of their finances, because of anything. Because of what they can do for you. The Bible says in Proverbs 17, verse number 17, a friend loveth at all times, and a brother is born for adversity. A friend's there to love and to care for you at all times. Good times, bad times, doesn't matter. Why? Because you're not using that person as a friend. You're there for him, no matter what happens. Proverbs 18, verse 24. The Bible says, A man that hath friends must show himself friendly. And there is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. The Bible says, If you have friends, you need to be showing yourself friendly. If you have friends, what? Being friendly, being friends with someone, you could call yourself friends, but you know what? At the, at the end of the day, being friends with someone is going to require some work. Yeah, that's right. It require you to give something of them. That's how you show yourself friendly. Hey, what can I do for you? How can I help you? And this is a Christian attitude and mindset we ought to have anyways, esteeming others better than ourselves, but especially when you have friends, you ought to be thinking, not what can my friend do for me, but what can I do for my friend? How can I help my friend out? My friend's going through something difficult. I want to help my friend. My friend has a need. I want to help my friend. That's what true friendship is. That's what biblical friendship is. Those are the friends you should be looking to have. And, and you know, kids, don't worry about making friends with the, the most popular person in the neighborhood or at school or wherever it is and just the person that everybody likes so that maybe if you're hanging out with a person that's real popular then other people will want to talk to you because you're friends with them you're using that person for your own gain for your own that's not the type of friendship you want why don't you make friends with people that you care about that you can help do things for and that they could be your friend too and you can have a mutual good friendship 
The Bible says there in, in Proverbs 18, 24, you know, you need to show yourself friendly. And there's a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. You think about the, the close bond that family ought to have, brothers and sisters, and say, man, my brother would be here. If I, you know, I have two brothers, and if I needed something, I know I could call on my brother, and my brother would help me out to the best they could. Why? Because he's my brother. Well, the Bible says there's a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. You can make friends with someone and be friend, you know, you're friendly with someone, make friends with a good person. You can have that type of a, of, of a love, not a homo love, I mean a real, genuine love like David had with Jonathan. They're good friends. The Bible says their soul was knit together. Why? They had a lot of things in common. They became just really good friends. They were there for each other to help each other out. That's a good thing to have. There was a friend that, st that stuck closer than a brother. Jonathan stuck by David's side. David's own brothers didn't always stick by his side. But there was a friend that stuck closer than a brother. It's good to make friends and to be friendly with people and, and to make good friends and not look for people who are just going to use you. Because on the flip side, you're going to have people that are just going to be looking to use you for something. Watch out for that. Last place we'll look at, Proverbs 22 Proverbs 22, verse number 24, Make no friendship with an angry, angry man, and with a furious man thou shalt not go, lest thou learn his ways and get a snare to thy soul. Be careful who you make friends with, because you often become like your friends. In this case, it's talking about an angry man. Someone who's just soon angry, flying off the handle, someone who gets in a lot of fights or whatever. You become friends with people like that, that's who you're going to turn out to be like. People, that's the way God designed us. You rub off on other people and they rub off on you. You'll notice that there's, there's um, things that you'll start doing different or maybe uh, ways that you speak. You notice someone talks a certain way or they use a certain expression. And then the longer you're with these people, you know, as a friend and the closer you become friends, we're going to start realize, hey, you're saying some of the same things that they say. It happens. And then the same things that they do. And your friend will do some of the same things that you do. And you kind of start doing different things together and you rub off on each other. Well, keep that in mind when you're making new friends with people. You don't want to be making friends with people who are just into all kinds of sinful lifestyle. Because they're going to tear you down. If you're trying to do what's right and go the good way and someone else is... is wants nothing to do with the Lord, don't be friends with those people. You get to, you know, this is a great thing about friends. You get to pick and choose who you want to be friends with. And it, this isn't a matter of, of using somebody, but it is a matter of you still have to be wise enough to keep yourself from falling. You can love people and give them the gospel and try to, and try to convince them to get right with God. But if they're going the wrong direction, don't yoke yourself up in friendship with those people. They choose to turn around and, and, and get right with God or get saved or whatever. Sure. Then you can be a good, you know, be a, a good friend of them. But until then, that's how you ought to be picking and choosing your friends. And, uh, you know, don't be like Samson here who needed some friends and they just kind of used them. He used these people to have his feast and um, it, it didn't work out for him. He couldn't, he obviously couldn't trust him with his wife. And you as a friend ought to be the type of person that can be trusted, that can be trustworthy, that can be there for someone in all times. And you can be the friend that sticks closer than a brother. That's the way that a Christian ought to view friendship. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for all the great things that we could learn from your words. Lord, I pray that you please continue to teach us and open up the scripture to us, Lord. I thank you for opening up that scripture to me that I, that I was misunderstanding, Lord. And I know, I'm, I'm sure there's probably others out there too that, I, that, that I'm not fully understanding properly, Lord. And other people as well, Lord, help us all to, to get a more complete and a more perfect knowledge of your word. And um, God, I pray that you please bless everyone here tonight. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.